Hi, excuse me, miss. Can I have a minute of your time? Sure. Well then, firstly, I'm Nick, and I'm going to be talking about TPI. TPI? What's that? Is that something that I should be aware of? Yes, TPI. I know it will be legend. Wait for it. So, TPI, better known as triose phosphate isomerase, which just so happens to be an enzymatic dimer made up of 250 residues, and it's also a critical part of glycolysis. Huh? Like a what? It just so happens that dimers of TPI are identical to each other and follow an H-fold alpha loop beta metabolic pathway. TPI requires no cofactor or metal ions for maximal activity. H-fold alpha what? Come on now, you lost me. TPI can be found in all organisms that is that perform glycolysis and also functions at physiological pH, which is 7.4, and is a kin kinetically perfect enzyme that is dairy. Legend dairy. So, was that your way of trying to pick me up? Huh? You're my friend. Suck, and I am not impressed. Lion? What's up, punks? Handle this creep for me while I go see an expert. You got it. <laughs> Wait, handle what? You! Whoa, 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 calm down, big fella. Let's handle this like adults. Is that a peanut over there? What? Chemistry! I didn't see you there. Are you here for the lecture? Yes, I'm eager to learn. Oh, well that's great, follow me. Welcome ladies and gentlemen. Here's the lecture on triose phosphate isomerase, a key enzyme in glycolysis. As you all know, triose phosphate isomerase, or TPI as we call it here, is an enzymatic dimer made up of 250 amino acid residues. It is very important to glycolysis and is perhaps one of the most critical enzymes in all of biology. Now if we can just go ahead and pay attention to the board, we'll be able to get started with the rest of the lecture. As you all can see on the board, we have the entire glycolytic pathway, starting with glucose and ending up with pyruvate. Throughout this process, we have a net yield of ATP of two molecules. That's very important because we need this ATP to feed into the Krebs cycle and other biological pathways. But the part we're going to focus on it is over there enclosed in the green. We have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate being cleaved and turned into 2,3-carbon molecules, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. This is important because glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is directly turned into pyruvate and we have the production of ATP. But however, if we have just a dihydroxyacetone phosphate, we will not have a net ATP gain, so that must be converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and that is done using triose phosphate isomerase. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on the actual, the actual uh, just reaction taking place that we're worried about right here, the conversion of the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Like you can see here, it's done here by um, aldolase, and this is our fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and here are the products we have. This isomerase right here is our TPI. That TPI is much needed to convert it back into the G3P. Now, can anybody happen to tell me the difference between our DHAP and our G3P? Anyone at all? I know! I know! Yes, young man in the front, please. It's an aldehyde and not a ketone. Very, very nice. They're very nice. Someone hasn't hit puberty. But anyways, so we have our aldehyde, which is characterizing our G3P, in order to be turned into our pyruvate. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to the mechanism, and that is going to kind of show you guys exactly how this 1-2 proton transfer is going to take place. So if you guys look here, we're going to have this mechanism here, and what I've done deliberately is not drawing in any arrows. So you guys have this with you, you have the, uh, the handout, and you have the arrows drawn in. I'm just going to go ahead and show you how it's done. In the first step, we have this active site. In the active site, we have our glutamic acid, we have our substrate in the middle, and then we have a histidine residue. The very first step to notice is we have this negatively charged um, oxygen right here sharing through resonance with this OH group. The first step is it deprotonates this methyl um, methoxy group on the end of the substrate. What that does is it brings this over here, these electrons, to make a carbon to carbon double bond, and then these electrons go back up onto the oxygen, but for sake of time, we're going to move them and grab that H from the histidine. 
and we get to this product over here. As you guys can see, there is this um, alkene in addition to these two hydroxy groups. And what we call this is, is an enediol intermediate. This enediol intermediate is pretty important because now we have this resonance between the nitrogen, between the two nitrogens of the histidine ring and our enediol, which is a very key step in doing this isomerization. The next step to notice is that we have this OH group being deprotonated by this nitrogen right here. So using this lone pair, we take away that H, giving the electrons back to that oxygen, and that's the only step to get to this intermediate. The very last step to do this is these are gonna donate down to get to here. Then we're gonna have these uh, electrons in this, pi, in this pi system in the P orbitals. They're gonna go out and grab a hydrogen from the glutamate giving electrons back here to this oxygen of the glutamate. And we're going to get to our final product where we have regenerated our active site, glutamic acid, and our histidine, but we have converted the DHAP into G3P. Now we have this hydroxy group on this position in an aldehyde instead of a ketone. Now I would ask you if you had any questions today, but I do know that I am great enough to know that you don't have any questions. I explained it just as perfectly as it needed to be done. Thank you and have a great night. Now we're going on to Matt with the kinetics and pH dependency of what we call TPI. Thank you, Josh, you arrogant prick. Now that you know about the mechanisms of TPI, I'm going to go on to talk about the kinetics and the pH. TPI is known as what is known as a kinetically perfect enzyme, and this means that it catalyzes the isomerization of DHAP to G3P so quickly that the rate of reaction is determined by the diffusion rate of the substrate. In other words, it takes longer to add the substrate to the solution than for the reaction to actually take place. So, in order to make sense of the speed, the rate of isomerization without the enzyme first has to be analyzed. Now, the rate with TPI, the KCAT is 2.56 times 10 to the fifth, and without it, it is tenfold slower than it is with the enzyme. Therefore, whether the increased rate of reaction is from the fact that TPI is an isomerase, or that it is just a system of quick acid-based proton transfers, it cannot be denied that the enzyme greatly increases the reaction rate. Now, moreover, the pH for this enzyme and the reaction is equally important as kinetics. The enzyme itself has a pKa of approximately six to nine, and according to Anne Lambier, one of our personal friends, we talk to her on a daily basis. She works at the International Institute of Cellular and Molecular Pathology in Brussels, Belgium. She told us just last week that the optimal pH for the reaction as a whole is 7 to 9. And if the pH drops below this optimal range to an acidic pH of 5 to 7, the percent activity of TPI decreases to around 40 to 70 percent. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, if the pH rises above 9 from about 9 to 11 percent, the activity goes to zero, showing a dramatic stop at very basic pHs. Now, we're going to move on to Sarah, and she's going to talk to you about TPI deficiency. But first, always remember, lab safety. Never wear a shirt under your lab coat, and always roll up your sleeves. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Matt. And um, this is how you dress for lab. This is awkward. Now that we focus on the whole reaction, we're just going to talk about the enzyme. With TPI, your usual products are 2 ATP, 2 NADH, and 2 pyruvate. Without TPI, you get no ATP, only 1 NADH, 1 pyruvate, and 1 DHA. TPI is found in all organisms that perform glycolysis, so there are problems if it's not functional. The deficiency is a recessive disorder caused from a homozygous missense mutation. It causes infant hemolysis, neuromotor retardation, and is fatal. Children with this disease require a ventilator support by age two. Because no ATP is produced, there is reduced aerobic respiration and not enough energy in the cells leads to an inability to breathe, breathe independently. No cure or treatment is available right now, which is really bad for TPI deficient patients. But it may work out well for you guys. Are you a broke college student on the verge of graduation with no idea what you're gonna do with the rest of your life? You can leave CNU, go out into the big scary world, cure TPI deficiency, and make a lot of people very happy, and also probably become a millionaire. Thanks, guys.